This is our last talk on the studio stage today, and the last talk studio stage for this conference. And it's uh, an honor for me to introduce Christopher for this talk, who kind of brought me into the project, I would say, <laughs> way back. <laughs> Was uh, it so, yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, uh, You job. invited <laughs> me to a round of people in the evening back then, which included like all the people back then that were kind of involved with this project. And from there on out, yeah. I joined. So I guess that's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Besides kitesurfing and lots of other stuff. So yeah, let's get this going. It's 2023. Your AI assistant just gave you a brilliant solution for your customer's project. You can't wait to impress them by quickly implementing it. But then you realize you have to use that legacy front-end tooling. The system is outdated, slow, and clunky. You curse the day you agreed to work on this project. But there is no turning back now. You have to figure it out. You start by digging through old code and documentation. It's a frustrating and time-consuming process. You wonder how anyone ever managed to work with this system. Your AI assistant tries to help, but it's not much use. It was designed for the modern web, not this antiquated workflow. You keep on it, determined to make it work. Hours turn into days, and days turn into weeks. You're about ready to give up when you finally crack the code. You implement your AI system's brilliant solution and it works perfectly. You feel a sense of accomplishment, but also relief that it's over. You vow to never work with the legacy system again. You can't wait for the future where everything is modern and streamlined. Yeah, well, um, welcome everybody. So I could help myself and use uh, these fancy tools myself and let ChatGPT write the first slide and create a nice story. And I borrowed some voice, I think from uh, some popular <laughs> narrator and then tried to voice more. And it, I mean, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, the future. So. For me, uh, the way we create for the web and the web itself are constantly changing. So um, the approaches we know are replaced or um, uh, questioned and complemented. And yeah, there are many new paradigms for creating web experiences um, from a website focused on content and uh, to more complex applications. And what I think is common to them is the use of, of front-end technologies on the server and a more streamlined build process and where like the build tooling is part of the framework. And um, you might already know some of them. I'm not the ultimate expert on these systems. And this is just a selection and there are constantly, it's, it's a constantly growing list of systems. So, um, our journey began with Next.js, and this is what I want to focus on in this talk. And, but as we will see, the actual technology you choose here is not as um, important because the approach we took could be adapted to other frameworks. But before we dive deeper, it's always good to ask why. Why should we do it? Is it a good idea? And of course, there's not a single answer, but as we will see, this approach or these approaches open up a new whole new world of possibilities and um, let's have a look at an example of a website with some e-commerce elements because it's more interesting than a purely content focused website and um, if we break it down just some simple sketch to to see some elements you have some kind of logo and a navigation and uh, a card for your shopping cart and maybe shows how many items you have in there, a, a product page with some content and an add to cart button. And yeah, some are pretty static, others have to fetch content and um, others are interactive like the adding to cart button or the display of how many items you have. So how do we traditionally implement it? 
So we have, a, a, as we know, server-side CMS, which uh, creates the markup for the site. Then we have some build tooling and create some JavaScript solution, if it's uh, React, Vue.js, Vanilla, whatever, uh, maybe a mix of different techniques. And um, the, these are mostly served by a web server or the CMS. And these will talk to the CMS or some shop API, and also the CMS needs some data from the shop API to, to display products or import them. So um, what we see here is that we mix for, for a single feature, it goes through all the layers, and every layer has something to do with it. And for example, the, the, the front-end rendering is partly defined in the CMS, maybe also on the JavaScript part for special widgets. So this is one of the things that's, that's really, um, yeah, where it's not very streamlined. And for example, with Next.js, um, we have more integration at the boundary between client and server. And everything on the site is actually a React component. And uh, most important is that the request from your browser goes to Next.js and not to your CMS. And um, in Next.js, uh, on the server side, this is where the data fetching happens. And uh, after the browser loaded the site, uh, the same React component can work client-side for interactive components. And the CMS is now more or less headless and is just one of the data sources. So Next.js can fetch data from your CMS, from a shop API or from other systems. And the CMS doesn't play such a special role. And we can now implement uh, features across the client and server layers much easier. And Next.js also builds all our front-end assets and takes care of things like code splitting and other optimizations. So it makes the whole build process much easier. And if we talk about this uh, data fetching and rendering, what, what do we mean here, actually? So it, it's good to define the terms, because I will mention them again. Um, CSR is client-side rendering. And this is basically React as you know it. It's, you load the JavaScript. React takes, part, uh, takes uh, over some part of your DOM and uh, will take care to de declaratively uh, update it, depending on the logic. And then we have server-side rendering. And this is more special. This is where Next.js will do some asynchronous logic, for example, to fetch some data. And it also has access to the, to the current HTTP request, uh, which is useful for authentication and other features where you need a current request. And then Next.js will generate also the markup via React and, and send it to the client, uh, to the browser, where, again, client-side rendering take, co uh, take care of uh, interactive components. Then we have static site generation. Um, and it is used to pre-render pages, including data fetching. And they can be generated during build time and can be regenerated on demand. And there is no access to the current request because we can generate them in advance and there might be no HTTP request happening. And these types of rendering give you a lot of flexibility because you can mix and match depending on your uh, scenario and requirements. For example, some part of a web application might be more or less static. You use static generation. Then you have some kind of user login and portal uh, on, on the side where you use server rendering. And or an e-commerce side. So it's, it's really nice to have these possibilities. And that's it. Uh, that's at least one thing because why it's so interesting to, to look, look into this approach and uh, make it usable for NEOS. Yeah, so how can we use it with NEOS? The big question. We want to uh, use this architecture. And um, how does NEOS fit into it, actually? So let's go through our journey. And, and see what the choices and obstacles were that we faced. So our first goal was to use NEOS as the source for content in the Next.js front. And, and that mean, means we would like to have all document nodes in NEOS available as pages in Next.js. And we also needed to implement the rendering for all content node types that we are using. 
And in the beginning, the big question was whether we want to go fully headless and implement every node type in, in Next.js with React components and transfer all the node properties through some API. And um, if we were to go headless, then there would be no fusion for rendering in years. And all markup would be created via React components. And there would, to have, uh, there would have to be a mapping between all node types and React components. But as a benefit, we could move uh, the front-end aspects out of NEOS. And that means no Fusion code that generates HTML and, and all CSS and JavaScript would go into Next.js. But in our case, we, first we were reluctant and to implement this detailed integration, so we considered another more hybrid approach where NEOS provides some structured data about our documents and notes via an API but markup will be rendered via Fusion and to save all the detailed effort. And after a first brief attempt, it uh, became clear this, that, this we, uh, that you would get a, a working solution with Next.js. And, um, but, and this is important, the architecture would mix even further. So it wasn't a very good idea. And in the end, you would uh, miss out on a lot of opportunities you get. So yeah, we went for the headless approach. And during this time of experimentation, we created a content API package to provide a very simple JSON API to fetch a list of documents, basically documents and their route path, because this is very convenient to have just the URI path for each document, and a detail view for each document node. And the actual data that is returned is declared via Fusion, so you can basically extend for every node time all the properties that you return. And uh, first we used it for this more hybrid approach, but later we saw that we could use just the same package for a more generic approach where we just return all the properties in some serialized form via JSON. So how do we use that to have all the rendering in Next.js? So we had a catch-all catch route with this special bracket syntax, which is just a, a naming convention in Next.js for a, a, a slug route. You can read it up in the documentation if you want to know more. Uh, know more. And um, path here refers to an argument that we will get where we get the full path for yeah, whatever URI path you want to, to show. And um, then we have these two uh, functions, static functions exported, which is, if you know some Next.js, how it works for the data fetching. One is uh, for how to get a list of all documents to pre-generate, and the other is uh, for what are the properties for a specific page, depending on the path. So this is where it comes together. And each page is rendered by a React component, by using the data for the node itself, including child nodes, the site, and other meta information. So this is basically the details of the content API. And the idea here is that all the data from the CMS that we need to render the page is inside this response. So we include everything we need for navigation. So this is a little bit site-specific and needs to be adjusted to, to your needs some metadata for your site itself, and then the, the document node, including all content collections and their children. So this is basically what you always want to have when rendering a page. And then we have some kind of mapping where we um, have a mapping from node type name to React components that can render this information. And it's a good idea to split up components for content and presentational purposes here. So this is why this is named document page and content headline here, to make it less ambiguous. And um, a React context is used to pass the document data and props of the current node down the component tree. So I have some examples later. Not too much code, don't worry. Um, and here you can see like the component structure on the top we have a doc document page which is resolved from this node type via the mapping. Then we provide some helper for a content collection. 
um, which iterates through child nodes and uh, then comes our content headline node which knows how to render a headline. In this content headline component we have a presentational component which is just very basic whatever you use um, to, to output markup with classes, attributes, everything. So, um, If you know some React that should be pretty straightforward. And if we have a look at the code that we need in, in NEOS to, to output the, 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 the content, this is basically all the fusion we need. There's some other parts for shortcut handling and stuff, but um, this is enough to, to define the meta information, including the navigation, and this is very ge generic, a recursive rendering of all the nodes, so this is more or less enough for, for a simple site. So this is all the fusion we have, no fusion for rendering, and uh, then we have, oh, that was a bad transition. <laughs> um, then we have a, a page component, um, like you saw, and uh, so layout here again is more or less presentational. You can choose your, your layout and, and use React components like you want. And then we have the content headline. Here you see the, the use of a context to fetch the current node, which is very convenient because the content collection can change the context, so uh, components that are rendered inside the content collection get a reference or get get hold of the current node during the iteration. So basically, like you know it in Fusion, if you know it. And um, yeah, you can access the properties of a node, do some React, and uh, yeah, basically that's it. You have a statically generated site with uh, Next in Next.js with data from NEOS. So, but but what about editing? So. I think that's the interesting part. The other part is not that interesting. <laughs> and I, I think many of you already experimented with it. So I, I talked to some of you and, and I always said, ah, I did that and tried it and here. And, but, but I think this is like the holy grail. How, how do I use editing with headless together? And um, yeah, how can, can we provide a fam familiar experience for editors? That was our question. And we could simply use NEOS with structured editing without a front-end preview, and it could work. But for us, it was we would use one of the main selling points of NEOS there, the NEOS UI, inline editing, full preview, which is basically what, what NEOS should feel like. And another thing that was not so easy was to update our statically generated pages if content in NEOS was changed and published. But I'll come later to that, and there are some interesting details, I think, and it, it took some time to get this right. So our next goal was to have a great editing experience. And it was a few months after our first tries um, that we took on the challenge, um, and we, we had the goal to, to see how, how could we build a full end-to-end -end editable solution with NEOS, and is it possible at all? And the goal was to have the same editing experience of a NEOS setup with a traditional rendering via Fusion and support all the NEOS UI features. And now we, we had the first major issue. There's no front-end in NEOS to render the preview of a node. So how do we create a preview of a node in a user's workspace? Hmm. And this was the most important idea, I think, what if we could use Next.js frontend, a Next.js frontend that we defined and use it just inside the UI for the preview so the NEOS UI could take over and make it editable. And let's have a look, at how, let's have a look on how that could be performed. So the backend content module in NEOS will request the preview route from Next.js and it will supply the same information as for the normal editing preview, which is currently a context path with, with a user workspace and some dimension information, so it's not only a node route path or URI path. And in Next.js, this route will fetch the details from the content API 
via server-side rendering and uh, forwards the NIA session because we need authentication here. So uh, we need access to the node in the user workspace and this is restricted. And the page rendering in NIA's, uh, in Next.js also needs to output some additional data for the editing with uh, special information of a serialized node that the NIA's UI can understand. And which brings us to the question whether we can generate the needed markup and notify the NIA's UI after the preview page was loaded. And this took quite some reverse engineering and trial and error to figure out all the needed bits and pieces. And I will spare you all the details here, but um, yeah, you might have guessed it, it was possible. And uh, we, we could use all the information the normal NIA's front end rendering does and like uh, emulate them in Next.js. And uh, one central idea again was to use hooks inside the content components and to, to generate all the attributes and push the serialized node data, which is like an implementation detail of the NIOS UI. It needs some more information about each node in its raw form and push that into to a global variable and whatnot. It's, it's a little bit messy. There is no official API there, so we like have to pretend Neo surrendered the page, but it works. So this is again uh, the, the headline uh, component, for example, and not much changed to the previous version, but we now see two different components. We use not a basic diff, but a content component which is, if you know it, just like in Fusion AFX, it does some additional wrapping and adds some special data attributes for the NIOS UI and gets it uh, node from the context. So, And then we have an editable helper, which also adds some special metadata for inline editing. So this is all we needed to change after figuring out how to make it a, a nice API. And Let's see if uh, we can see a difference. Uh, and I, I prepared a, a demo recording here. And as we can see, there is no front end if we go to the NEOS uh, front end directly, um, just an error message. So there is no rendering defined. But if we go to the Next.js server, we can see a rendered front end. And when we navigate to other pages, there are some nice transitions which are quite natural to implement because the outer app component in Next.js persists between page loads and it can be nicely animated. So, and further page loads are also quite instant because it's a statically generated site. And even if this runs locally, um, Next.js performs some nice tricks to preload information about a page so it's, it's already there if you hover over a link. So these are very nice things. And now let's lo log into the NEOS backend and see how this preview works from Next.js. I mean, you don't see much of a difference because you can edit content. And uh, you can publish and we can directly see the change in the Next.js front end and we can insert new elements. Uh, section. And a headline. And also this out of band rendering, if you know it, is done via Next.js. With a, this was also a small tricky part because if you insert an element, Neos UI needs some markup to, to insert it, and Neos doesn't know anything about how a no, uh, node should be rendered. Yeah, yeah. So you see, we we can insert content, and we can uh, of course use inspector properties and update uh, images. Yeah. So everything works as usual. And. Yeah, we, we had one little issue, and uh, we let, let's now update 
a title of a page so you understand where we are here, uh, what, what the issue is. Um, if we publish it, um, we see it's changed here on that side, ah, but not on the others. Ah, cache and validation. <laughs> so um, let's have a look how regeneration of statically generated pages, um, how that actually works and what you can do there. So what do we need to invalidate and when? Um, if we use a static site generation in Next.js, basically a static version of a page is generated. And that means no further data fetching occurs after the initial render and there are some files created for future requests. And this means if you change data, you will still get the stale request of the first initial creation. And Next.js offers a feature called incremental static regeneration, so a mouthful ISR. And this is basically, you can ha uh, implement a special API route and use an, uh, a, a helper function to regenerate the static version by yeah, your parameters, w which is our route path in that case. And um, then the whole generation process will um, yeah, be done in, again, so it will fetch data from NEOS and create a new version, so everything is fine. Um, yeah, but only NEOS, of course, knows when, when content changes, so we had to implement something in NEOS and inform Next.js if things change. And this is how, how, we, how we did it, and um, so if nodes are published, we collect all the document nodes of all the changed Notes, so there could be some content here, some content here, and we only care about documents. And we send this list of, of route paths to, to Next.js, to this API route, um, to, to inform Next.js that it should be revalidated. And then this incremental static regeneration takes over and updates it. Turns out it is, it is synchronous. It is not, it's not asynchronous. There is no background worker. So if you have a huge list of pages, this could take a while. And then we have dependencies in the data, which is also a big issue in Fusion with, with the content cache and cache tags and everything to get right. So, and so what, what if pages use data outside the nodes that actually changed? So menu, for example, is a good thing mostly every site has, or could be teasers, content references. So, and yeah, we, we discussed a lot of different uh, approaches here, including some kind of tagging, like with a content cache, and yeah, all, I don't know, too, too many different solutions. And um, the biggest drawback was that uh, we would again have some kind of definition in NEOS about the rendering, and we would have a lot of additional complexity if we did that. So. Then we came to a conclusion, what if we regenerate everything after every change? <laughs> Which sounds very robust for me. So, but it could take too long if we have too many nodes. And there might be a long delay until a, an editor sees his or her changes, which is also not good. And then in Next.js we don't have a built-in queue mechanism, so we, we actually offer some basic revalidate all helper, which does that, but if you have more than, I don't know, a dozen pages, it could get slow. So you publish and the request actually takes a little bit. So turns out these are more or merely technical challenges and we, we could solve it by adding some additional service, which is called Grazer, which kind of fits to the Zebra theme, which we named the package. And um, it, it's a small background service that implements a smart priority queue. And we basically process pages that are explicitly changed with more priority and all the rest that we just regenerate to be sure it's consistent with lower priority. Then we did duplicate paths. So if while it's still regenerating even for 10,000 pages, an editor publishes again. The queue figures out what, what is an explicit change and deduplicates all the other things so we, we don't have a growing list because editors are constantly 
changing. So this, I would say, is also some learning from other public, uh, publishing solutions where this could happen. Yeah, so this was the mi missing piece, actually, for, for larger sites to, to make this viable, I think. And now we have a full editing experience, which I think is almost ready for production. So we actually use it in production, but, the, but there might be some rough edges still here and there. But yeah, the, feature, uh, the whole approach and concept works. Yeah, so we have no cash to, to, to emphasize this. So Next.js is our cache. Everything else is basically uncached, so you don't have to deal with the cache in yours, which is very nice. We, we could solve this static... Uh, uh, incremental static regeneration thing, thingy, and um, all the rendering, like I said, is defined in Next.js. There's no fusion in Neos for markup, which is very nice. So, yeah, packaging it up. That was also a task to, to make sure we have some nice reusable packages. These are all open source, and um, the first one is Network Team Zebra is an npm package which provides these content collection, editable on hooks and other stuff. Then we have Network Team Neos Next, which is a composer package for Neos that implements this revalidation notification and preview rendering because that's pretty Next.js specific in the implementation. Then we have the content API package with, which we, with, which is rather generic and not very Next.js specific. And it's only a very simple API, so it's, it's not very sophisticated, but it works. And finally, Grazer as the missing piece, um, which you can deploy as a service to, to get the revalidation right. Yeah. And you can try it. We packaged it up as a demo uh, distribution with Neos and Next ready to run. So just yarn install, yarn dev, and it should run on your local machine to try it out. Yeah. <laughs> Just five minutes. No advertising. <laughs> So yeah, just just a quick run through some advantages to, 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 uh, from our experience. So one is developer experience, which is very nice. With a fast refresh in Next.js, you have like instant changes. You edit some CSS class or edit some markup. It's instantly in your front end visible. So it's it's no more. Uh, so the whole feedback cycle is much nicer. There's less effort when implementing node types because you only have to touch node types YAML and the rendering definition in Next.js. And um, from my perspective, it, it should also be much easier to onboard more developers to Neos projects because knowing React and JavaScript is much more common than special knowledge of Fusion and caching and stuff like that. So that could be very advantageous. And then there is no build tooling to maintain that could become legacy <laughs> until Next.js becomes legacy. But yeah, anyway, um, yeah, and the the architecture offers a lot of flexi flexibility, like with uh, the the possibility to integrate other data sources, middlewares in Next.js, and yeah, like I said, it it gives you a lot of opportunities you, you don't have if you have a more monolithic server-side CMS. And lastly, performance. It's pretty good right off the box, and um, you, Next.js just offers a lot of optimizations for front preloading, image, regener uh, image generation, um, and all the other things, like, like best practices with ESLint in the front-end coding, and the, the, the tool chain gives you a lot of help there. Yeah, so... That's it. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like an amazing solution, and I think the audience agrees to that <laughs> assessment because there's a lot of questions that go into the specifics. Um, I would try to yeah. bundle it up in some way to make it a bit more concise. 
Uh, there are two questions about uh, having uh, the client SDK, JavaScript, uh, the content API open source, but I think you answered that. So mm -hmm. I hope if no one cries, I think we are fine on that part. Cool. Um, did you think about uh, generating the Next.js components from the uh, node types directly? Is that something you would mm, find interesting? No, not, not yet. But do you think that's interesting or do you think that's not necessary? Yeah, so, so basically as you don't need to do anything for the content API because the JSON that we return is pretty generic, there's no work there really. And you, you, you always have to implement your component to do the actual rendering. Yeah, so, so maybe you could do some stuff there, but for me it, it wouldn't be the main case that, that solves a lot of issues. Right. So, um, what would you say to the the problem of that that you go through a lot of trouble to uh, do something that you uh, that you could do with probably a CMS that is more suited to the task directly? It, that's a good question, and you should always ask that if if there isn't this an easier solution. That's why I try to give a little perspective perspective on the whys and also the advantages because if you have more complex requirements, if you have like these issues of implementing widgets with, with whatever kind of front-end technology and have to touch a lot of layers to implement these requirements, then you know the pain and it, this, I think this initially more complex architecture, of course it's more complex in some way, will Make uh, make it much easier in the longer run, yeah. So it's okay. always a trade off in engineering. Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Yeah. It depends. Yeah. Uh, so what about node references? Are they immediately resolved at the API layer in the content API? Yes or no? You kind of. Kind of. Kind of. It depends. It depends. <laughs> So, so you can hook into the, the f so since the API response is Fusion, um, you can hook into that. I think the the property uh, uh, the property conversion is not so extensible yet. Um, yeah, but but that I think that we consider, can consider it as kind uh, kind of work in progress. There there will be some. Uh, it will get better. I think so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. As, as, uh, like I said, as we have more experience from more projects, we know which features need additional support. And yeah. So, what is the um, comparison of using the static site generator with using Neos built-in rendering and the Varnish cache or something else in, uh, before in terms of performance? I think performance-wise, once you have everything. Uh, requested, so your, your varnish cache is, is warmed, or you use some special kind of uh, cache pre-warming, there should be almost no um, performance uh, yeah, difference. Maybe even Next.js adds a little bit of overhead on the client because it ships some more JavaScript and the client has to do more, so that's no, uh, yeah, you have to be aware of that. Uh, but yeah, I think if, if it's only about the server side, then that's okay. But most more complex sites, we, we don't. Maybe it's not the best solution if it's very content heavy. But if you have at least some indi some interactive element or some element that depends on the user of of authentication or or real time data, then the whole varnish approach fails, and you have to rethink a lot about caching. And and here it's the mix and match. You can use static read. Static generation, do some client side or server side, and yeah, that's really what helps to, to solve these more complex scenarios. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, then I will try to put these two together. Is uh, what are the server requirements for Grazer, and do you still use the Node.js part of Next.js, and do you mm -hmm. need it? Yes. You need Node.js to run Next.js, especially for this, because we need uh, server-side rendering. If you have purely static generation, you can like export a st really static HTML version. But here, um, you need uh, a running uh, Node server, and it, but it can be quite e easily packaged up uh, as a container, or you can maybe also run it on Vercel, or yeah, which like just put it there and it should run and. 
And Grazer is uh, a small Go microservice, so it's, it, it runs on any platform. It's also, also packaged as a con uh, Docker image, so and there's basically no other requirement because it's, it's in, in memory queue. Basi basic idea is if Next.js is redeployed, you always start with a fresh instance, so we don't need a persistent queue there. Um, and um, one thing that it also does is it will pre-warm on the first start. There are some, if, if you have interest, I, I skipped that part about deployment because there are some things to, um, yeah, that we found out. Do you want to generate all content in your CI pipeline, but then you need a running Neo system, but that might not be the current version? And yeah, so there are some questions there, but there are also some, some good solutions, I think. Cool. Um, so, did you try this already with other frameworks like uh, Vue or Svelte? No, but I, but I, but I talked to, to some people already, and there's uh, apparently quite some different, <laughs> quite some variety of <laughs> these frameworks. And uh, yeah, with with Nux.js, uh, I talked to Martin, and I think that would be a nice case. Or Svelte Kit, uh, yeah, would be very interesting to see if we can just do the same thing. And um, I think one major concern is that we don't have a stable API towards the NEOS UI, and that's one thing I would like to push also mm -hmm. strate strategically for NEOS to support that, these. <laughs> that was, would be a question from me, but there are so many questions already <laughs> that I sk skipped yeah. asking that one, but yeah, yeah cool. Um, so, is, uh, did you did, did you experience other benefits uh, for using Neos in this way compared to using a uh, out of the box uh, headless CMS? I, I mean, I, the editing experience. Yeah, I don't have much experience with other CMSs, to okay. be yeah, <laughs> honest. Fair, fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, um, there, there are so many, and I, what I heard is. There isn't this end-to-end -end capability of preview workspaces publishing in any of them. So right. yeah. maybe they might be better in some kind of structured editing, and you just can click your content types and properties together with a with an UI, or they might offer real-time editing. But uh, it's it's the package that we can provide here. I think that's. Yeah. All right. Thing. There's um, a couple more questions about the about the editing, and I guess we can address that all together. So, I guess uh, one question is: Would it be possible to integrate drag and drop for the content elements? Because now we know how the backend looks like compared to a generic Neos experience, so that could be easier to implement, I guess. And then also, um, what about using inspectors that um, change the rendering? Um, but I think you addressed the, the, that. That already the works because the JavaScript basically, the Neos UI takes care of then doing the preview node call to, to generate some markup and replace it. So that already works. Um, cool. And the other question I, I didn't fully know, I don't fully know how to. <laughs> I guess someone had to, would have to look into that. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I guess with the drag awesome. and drop, I, yeah. I don't don't really know if if, if it it actually changes something. Yeah, yeah, yeah makes sense. Uh, there's uh, the short question about what about image variants? I guess also relating to the content API. Yes. So um, we there there are some different approaches. So for production, I would actually use some image proxy tool in front of that and just return like an S3 hash and. Uh, or S3 URL and do all the, th the stuff on, on an image proxy and, mm -hmm. and define a proper loader in Next.js. So there's the concept of image loaders, which basically return an URL depending on width and quality, and I think. And um, so then you have all the benefits of, of that fitting into it. You could also just return a, like a base version of an image, which is maybe too large, and then use whatever Next.js tooling and packages offer. So there's a lot of stuff around there. So there's just so many people using it. So the internet is full of ideas. <laughs> right. And, and image variants work. So yeah. you can crop, and I think we, we tested and used that already. So, yeah. Cool. And then the last question um, Do you use the Next.js routing? Yes. So, so we. Um, we use still the old approach of pages and not these app layouts, uh, but we 
uh, use the Next.js routing for the normal pages, but also for be because you go to, to Next.js, we will intercept the call to Neos slash preview. This is how we do the front end preview rendering in, in Next.js. And um, there's also some uh, forwardings in the redirects to take care of resources and other stuff to forward that to, to Neos. So, yeah. But you can also add your custom routes in addition to content routes. Mm -hmm. So you could have fully Next.js routes um, next to, to Neos. So that's also a very nice possibility. All right. I think that's it. Thank you very much for patiently yep. answering yeah, all the questions. You.